run a games company based in Cambridge, just down the road. Um, there are roughly 230 of us. You may know us from, well, Elite all those years back. Um, but also, more recently, Rollercoaster Tycoon with Chris Sawyer, Wallace and Gromit, Thrillville, Rollercoaster Games, Lost Winds. And this year, a game called Connectimals with Microsoft, which features big cats, and it's aimed at a very young audience. So, I must say, I was blown away with what David and Dawn were saying, particularly in terms of seeing games being used in the classroom. I think that's absolutely phenomenal. So, obviously, I wrote some of what I said before <laughs> hearing that. So, uh, I, I feel um, um, uh, perhaps... Anyway, never mind. So, okay, what motivates kids today? If you ask a typical kid, it's partly created by TV, um, money, fame, and it's got to be easy. I think that Big Brother X Factor have done a lot of damage. Um, so we've got this instant celebrity idea reinforced every single day by the mainstream media, where hard slog is not what they're showing. They're showing immediate graphic gratification. And the, in practice, real life does require hard slog. And, you know, the, the daunting amounts of pre preparation are really off-putting. Now, interestingly, these pictures, um, the super embarrassing one on the bottom right is myself and Ian Bell, with whom I wrote Elite. And above that are the Darling Brothers, who founded a company called Codemasters up in Warwickshire. So it just shows we are, we have come through this system, and there were things that motivated us way back when. So... You would think from that, oh, today's kids are doomed. They're never going to survive unless they become a winner on Big Brother. Um, now, as Dawn has brilliantly preempted, <laughs> um, games are a great weapon for education. And I think the real thing is, I mean, have you ever heard a kid saying, oh, do I have to play 10 more minutes of whatever the game of the moment is? I think it was Dual Jump this Christmas. Um, you know, or can I stop playing Mario and go and do my homework? You know, it just doesn't happen. They, you have to tear them off it. And I think that's the point. I think that's the, been the message of this whole um, event. And it's, it's a very, very powerful thing. The, the, the important thing is computer games, and by that I mean everything from Facebook to console games to sort of to connect to Wii, motivate kids. They're self-motivated because there's this huge feeling of progression. There's a lack of criticism or failure. And it's small, easy steps that are easy to understand. Because what really worries me about teaching is learning things, unless you're very clever, without a teacher is actually really hard. And so what games do is we do these very small incremental steps, each of which is motivational, each of which has rewards in it. And for that reason, kids love them, and they love the wor worlds that are represented within the games. And ironically, they are putting in those weeks and months of hard slog. It's astonishing how much what in game design we call grinding uh, kids will do. You know, and, dare I say it, they can often learn in the process, as long as it's secret, as, uh, as Dawn mentioned. So the real question is how to harness it. Now, the, I think the best way, by far, is to have a great teacher, and there are a lot of great teachers around, but I'm really heartwarming to see what Dawn was saying about using games in the classroom, just as subject matter to get kids to engage with each other, to get kids to actually engage with the world, because the social discussion, you know, having a, a machine between four people is actually a very, very social thing, even if the game itself is a single-player game. But unfortunately, the world is not full of teachers like that. You want kids to be able to learn on their own. Now, um, one of our games, uh, a game called Rollercoaster Tycoon 3, there's an, a, a huge creative element to it, uh, where m mostly kids, but some adults, put together absolutely masses of brilliant, beautiful things. And the, the only real reward is sharing them online with, other, with their peers. But they put in a, a huge amount of effort to that. And it shows that the, there is willing there, that these kids, A, have the time to do it, they have the desire to do it, and they have had to achieve something in order to do it. Um, and even games that are often criticised, like um, there's a game called uh, Halo. P people probably know about Halo because it's involved um, multiplayer shooting, but part of it is something called Forge, which I think is, is really interesting. Because it's very, very simple. You can change the game rules, you can lay out your own maps, and then you can play games on them. 
And the important thing is those players have put in the effort to find out how to do it because it's, non, it's non-trivial, but it's all self-directed. And I think that is really, really powerful. And just looking online, um, it's amazing what you can find. That that's actually Homer Simpson laid out in guns, if, for those who, who can't see. And I, I saw that one and just found it quite bizarre. The key thing, though, is accessibility. Um, all of th- these games are running on, on PC, but also on console. And a lot of kids don't have a PC to which they have access at home because, um, you know, there's this fear, especially if it's a, a parent's PC where there's, they do work on it. But they do have access to consoles, to DSs, to Xboxes, to PS3s, um, to, to Wiis, and, and now iPhones, in fact, certainly iPod Touches, where there is no... It, the PC is essentially a barrier then. But because there is this learning on these platforms, those are the, perhaps the platforms we should also be looking at. Now, the beauty with these game creation tools is there's not a huge learning step before they produce something. The impetus is there because they've actually played the games already, so they know what they're getting into. So that the motive to make it better, to change it, oh, this is really annoying, oh, but I could fix it, I could put a rocket launcher where I need one or whatever. I don't think it really matters that actually the topic of the game is killing each other, because actually it's not. A lot of the creations are about... Um, infecting each other with disease or whatever, you know, there's a zombie games and things like that, which I know still not brilliant, they're not games that, that we make, but the fact is it's harnessed the kids and huge numbers of them, I'm talking millions of levels created. But the problem is, where do they go from there? Now, there are some fantastic tools, there's um, something called XNA on Xbox, which allows you to create games yourself, it's programmed in C Sharp, it's, it's quite a challenge. Um, similarly, there's a little device that I'm sure many of you know. Who know about Arduinos? Um, okay, for those who don't know, so I don't know, maybe you all know and are not putting your hands up. It's a, a small device that you can program in a, a high-level language that you can get to do stuff, whether it's turning your lights on, whether it's turning your hi-fi on or whatever. But I think that also there's a lot of alert learning about that. And there is a plethora of PC-based programming tools in C, C++, all sorts of high-level languages. The real problem, though, is there is this huge gap, and this, which can be filled by a teacher, and the problem is it needs someone like Dawn to do this, to bridge the gap from very, very easy, self-directed learning from things like Halo Forge, from Roller Coaster Tycoon, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them out there, to actual programming, where they're, they're, they're loading a compiler, they're compiling, you know, it, there's so much to learn, the infrastructure that we take for granted, I mean, I remember when I was first learning, um, it was very, very easy. But if the more barriers you put up, the more you'll go, oh, I'll just play a game, or I'll just go and look at YouTube, or whatever. So most kids and teens can't bridge that gap. Fortunately, some can, but most can't. And I think that's a big problem. And that's what I'd like to just touch on here. Now... A very, very old machine called the Acorn Atom was what I owe an awful lot to because it was very easy to program, it was relatively cheap for a kit, but more importantly, it came with everything. In the manual was how to program. You know, you wouldn't see that on a modern device. It would be too off-putting. But it didn't need intervention. And then the successor to it, very similar machine, slightly better, slightly faster, slightly more memory, um, the fact that it was endorsed by the BBC meant that BBC Micro Live and all these things came around it. And it became, it created a generator of prog- generation of programmers, not just me, but all my peers. Um, we started experimenting in BASIC. Now, a lot of the um, tech people amongst us will sneer at BASIC, going, oh, it's not object-oriented, all of this sort of thing. But ideals aside, it's very, very quick to get into. Within 10 seconds, you can type something in and it works. There's no learning how to do compilers. It's, it's very, very non-destructive. So if you do something wrong, it's not damaging. So there's not this fear factor that you're going to destroy daddy's computer because you're going to bring a virus in or whatever. You know, so I think that's very important, just the principle behind it. I'm, I'm not necessarily saying BASIC is the best language to do that. But the other thing that came along with it is doing this sort of thing, it, it seems amazing to believe now, was actually, I mean, a hateful word, but cool. It was a fashionable thing to do. The kids admired it. There was... 
there were things on TV talking about showing, you know, whiz kid, as the phrase was. Um, and even magazines had listings to type in. It would take a day to type in the wretched thing, then it wouldn't work. But people did it, and that was the amazing thing. The motivation was there because the, the, the end goal was, um, was clear to them. So, how do we get the stepping stone? Because the, the problem is, I mean, yes, BBC Micros are still out there. You can buy them on eBay. Um, but they're old-fashioned. They're not motivational to a kid. You can emulate it on PC, but again, that's not, the d desire isn't there. And to be honest, I think for today's, the way kids are driven today, it's too, it's too hard. It's too big a step. And it's not cool. Now, the real point with um, kids is, I, I, a, a big, I don't actually have the figures, but there's a big percentage of kids who do not have access to a PC at home, either because their parents aren't well off enough or they have a PC and the kids aren't allowed to play on it. They play on the kids' machines. And so that means a, there is a, a whole cohort of kids who are only have access to PCs at school. And I think this is a problem. And then other things that they don't see as PCs, like DSs, they do have access to, but there's much less learning on, unless it's directed learning. So how hard can it be to create something? And the answer is, well, it, it's probably quite hard, but it needn't be. Um, I've been looking at this for a long time with a group of people who feel that um, the equivalent of my generation today don't have the opportunities that we had. Um, so we've been looking at what, um, what can be achieved. And we've come up with a device. This is actually working hardware. Um, it's a prototype, and that strange wire at the top is actually something called a JCAT, JTAG cable, which is a debugging thing, so it wouldn't have that. Essentially, it's really, really small. You see there's a 20p in the picture. Um, and is a complete computer. It's everything you need to program. It can run all sorts of things from Project Canvas, which is you know, the BBC TV, to the web, to programming languages. But the important thing is it's very, very cheap to distribute. Now, we started it as a charity. We absolutely don't intend to make money from it. We can't. In fact, we can't. So the point really would be is looking at a way we can use something like this to provide a completely open source framework where um, there's free sharing of tools that can be used in the classroom with kids to do the sorts of things that Dawn has touched on, but to go to the next stage as well, to actually look at programming. Because I feel that um, the equivalent kid to me, who might be similarly motivated, would probably hate ICT and therefore be put off computers for good. <coughs> yep. So, oh yes, the, the machine has HDMI, it has um, an ARM CPU, it, it has all the things, it had wireless network runs Linux, so it's a full-on PC, but it's just, it can be made in a capsule that is utterly indestructible because it's only a few centimeters across. Now, imagine if you take a whole year group and give them one of these each so that everyone has one at home, and you just keep doing that for the same year so they gradually propagate through the student population. And if they break them, they'll be very, there's no battery in it, there's no screen, it's, it's very, very tough, it's powered off the USB. Um, it could be something that could be used as a vehicle because I think the important thing is to have the, the, sort of the feeling of ownership when you go home and that it's easily programmable. Now, um, we're looking at trialing that very soon, probably this year. Um, but the parallel point for me is one of the things which I actually talked about just over a year ago at, um, in this very room is that I've always had a problem with ICT because coming from a background where I've learned it myself, look, talking to kids, every kid I talk to says ICT is dull. They hate it. Now, I'm sure all you guys teach ICT way better, but unfortunately, the majority is learning how to use certain Microsoft tools, i.e. Word, maybe Excel, and how to find the on and off switch on the PC and how to use Windows. That is such a far distance away from what I'm talking about, to where, where the, this sort of self-driven learning happens. Um, I think it was very, very well-meaning to try and make ICT universal, which happened more than a decade ago, but it, I actually think it's backfired. 
For the kids who are generally familiar with computers already, it turned them off them. For those who didn't have access to computers, it just confirmed the fact that they, did, they weren't interested in it. Um, and there is a lot of stats to back it up. So this is a graph I actually showed here last year, and it, it's from um, the uh, Council for something, Heads of Computing, I think. Professors and Heads of Computing, that's it. Anyway, it's, it's it, real information from UCAS, and the, um, the pink line is IT professionals, showing the number of IT professionals has gone on increasing, but the number of applicants to computer science degrees has dramatically decreased. And that coincides exactly with when ICT students have gone all the way through lower school. So whether that's true or not, it's something that we've got to change. And hopefully this sort of thing could address the negativity that is out there at the moment towards ICT and actually fulfill the goals that ICT was created for. I mean, kids without home PCs could then have access to YouTube, to the web, to all the things that colleagues are talking about, so they don't feel excluded. But more importantly, they, they're all, they can start talking about the device as a, a connected device. You can email each other, all this sort of thing. And because they've got the same things the peers have, they're no longer excluded. And they could get excited about technology again. Right, that was, that was my point. I feel I've been dwarfed by what David and what uh, Dawn said before me. So, um, but I think we're actually all talking about very much the same thing, just from a slightly different direction. Um, I, I didn't mean to be too negative. I thought was the, the previous talks have been amazingly positive. And uh, thank you for listening to me going on. Thank you. David, um, thank you so much for that. And um, it says questions and answers on the screen. I might um, revise that to question uh, and okay, answers to, to try and give everybody uh, enough time. But can we take uh, one question from the audience, a burning, a burning question from someone who hasn't spoken, if there is one? Is there one I can't see in these lights? Yes, o over there. Do you... Hi, great presentation. Thank you. Apologies this morning I missed um, Ed Vizi. But I remember from last year, and of course everything has now changed with the new government, that they were going to make ICT into a core subject. I don't know if that's still on the plans, but would you know if they're planning to make it interesting? Because the statistics you showed, and my own knowledge as a practitioner, yes, ICT for kids as a lesson is incredibly boring and dull, and we need to bring the excitement back into it. So the question is, is ICT still on as core subject? Do you know, and are there any plans to make it interesting? Right. Firstly, I don't know. I have talked to Ed Vesey about it. Um, it's ironic that he's not education, and yet he's talking about it. <laughs> but um, so I can't comment on whether it's going to be a core subject or not. I mean, I think it, it's it sort of is de facto at the moment, just because it's it's in all the schools. But. Uh, you know, I'd much rather it weren't, personally. I'd much rather computer science were presented as an alternative to it, where they actually taught programming, they taught, you know, all of the, other, the, things that, the great things we've been talking about here. Well, Sorry, uh, just to say, I wouldn't call it a core subject because most kids only get 30 minutes access, whereas core subjects like English, math, science get five hours, five hours, and at least two hours. Yeah, but, I take yeah. your point. I think, and um, I think sadly we've got to move on from that one in order to give our next speaker enough time. But um, David Braben, thank you very much once again. Thank you.